You're listening to Rhett Read Podcast. I'm Anna. I'm Serge. And we're here to talk about books we've read. Hope you enjoy! Hey, Serge. Hey, Anna. Welcome back, guys. I'm back in the U.S. after a few weeks in Europe. Yeah, and you guys will be hearing this about a month from now, so you're, you're going to be thinking, oh, I guess this is when they didn't release any podcasts for a month. Okay. Yeah, we're really sorry about that, guys. And thank you so much for sticking with us. And thank you for not unsubscribing after I posted that one rando cast with our friend Ivan O'Neill. Ivan, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ivan. Thank you for suffering through that movie with me. He and I had a pretty good time watching that. It was an okay movie for how bad it was. I can't believe you guys missed the huge Stargate connection. We're all about Stargate here, and you didn't get it. Uh... So Anna is all about Stargate here, and and if she had not been enjoying herself in Europe, she would have gotten the connection. Instead, we focus on other things. You can find out what those other things are if you check out our Randocast about Mostly Ghostly, One Night in Doom House. Hey, have you been reading anything recently? Well, when you're in Europe and you're traveling by train, there's very little to do when you don't have phone service. So I ended up reading a ton of books on the train. Was one of them Girl on the Train? No. So I'm going to be talking about two books. They're in a series. It's a sci-fi series called The Themis Files. The first book came out last year. It's called Sleeping Giants. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're by Sylvan Neuville. The books are written in a World War Z style where it's interviews and diary excerpts. So if you're into that, you're totally going to be into this. My issue with this is that I'm more of a character kind of reader. You don't really get developed characters when you get books like these. They're very telling, not showing. And I prefer the show-don't-tell method of writing. So that kind of irks me. Did this book irk you that we just read? Are you talking about Ski Weekend yeah, by R.L. Ver- Stein? It was, it was a very not character-driven book. It was a plot-driven book. It was a very plot-driven book, yes. Um, I feel like the difference is that this is a dossier style of writing. So in the R.L. Stein book, it's from a first person perspective. Whereas this, you don't even get that sort of emotional, like even in the diary entries, they were still written in a way where they knew people would be reading it. So they would write it a specific way where it's like, I know you're reading this. So let me tell you how I felt. So I I think going back to what you said earlier, World War Z definitely had that style. Right. You don't connect with any one of the characters specifically because they're just very anecdotal. One and then another and then a third. Well, the difference between this and World War Z is that it follows a core group of characters. The issue is also the interviewer in this series. He's supposed to be this mysterious shadow broker type guy. I will end you if you don't do it my way, that sort of guy. And I thought that was just hilariously over the top. Like, you're supposed to be like, oh yeah, this guy can get shit done. And instead I was like, oh my god, I can't believe. I'm reading a character like this. But the story of Sleeping Giants is they're finding these giant body parts all over the world. So they start with finding a hand in Idaho or North Dakota or something. And they're like, this is a massive hand. I'm talking a massive hand. I'm talking like the entire thing ends up being like 200 feet tall. Oh, geez. That's a really big giant robot. When we talk giant robot anime, they don't usually get this big. And it's made by this material. They don't quite know what it is. And the inside of the robot, there's like a sphere where two pilots can go into pilot it. But the thing is... While everything is very humanoid about this robot, the knee joints are backwards. So the only way a person would be able to pilot it if their knee joints were the other way around. Do they have to break their legs to pilot it? Basically. Supposedly, our knees facing the way they do is not advantageous to walking or running, and it causes a lot of wear and tear on our joints. Actually, if our joints went the other way... It would be a lot better for us and the longevity of our joints and would really prevent arthritis in the knees. It would go a long way. The entire book is basically the political wheelings and dealings of getting the U.S. government to find all the different parts, going into other countries without their permission, and then dealing with the fallout there. SEAL Team 6. They actually would hire mercenaries to carry out their... uh, 
bigger things. And also like the pilots that they were going to use and then the people in charge of them. So it was a very almost political how to deal with this type of thing book. Things were moving quickly. The plot was moving quickly. But at the end of it, like I can see an anime being made out of it. But then the second book, which was just released and I received the arc from NetGalley. So I want to thank the publisher for that. It's called Waking Gods. They shouldn't have made this one book because this is where the story takes off. The robot was put on Earth by an alien species. The aliens have now come back to Earth and they're putting fucking giant robots in all the major cities because you know, that's what aliens do. Sure. It's very Independence Day-esque. It's, just, it's been established that this is what aliens will do when they come to Earth. They actually explain why in this book and it's the obvious reason that we all think of. You're still dealing with the political backgrounding but at the same time you're dealing with it's like Independence Day meets a Mecca. I did like the second book more than the first book. I gave the first book 3.25 stars out of 5, but I gave the second book 4 stars out of 5, simply because there was more action in the plot. And I think the author took more chances in Waking Gods than in the first book. He sort of copped out a lot of things and went, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. And then for the second book, he went, yeah, I can do what I want to do. And that really helped the narrative of the book. That sounds really cool. And I might actually read this book. All right. After the intermission, we are going to be talking talking about Fear Street Ski Weekend. Did you know that Ariel was a sprite? Wow, just saying sprite makes me feel thirsty. Let's talk about Fear Street Ski Weekend. How are your predictions? First off the bat, my predictions were not the best. I was going off the cover. And on the cover, they have their skis and their ski boots in the cabin. It turns out I was wrong. They don't actually bring their skis and their ski boots into the cabin. They leave them in the car. So I was wrong about that. I did say that it'd be a pretty serious looking mountain. And guess what? The post opening scene has one of the most serious looking mountain car driving situations you have ever heard of. They've got this ratty ass Plymouth with no working heat, probably bald tires, windshield wipers aren't even working and the windshield is freezing up. It's a whiteout and they're driving down the mountain and this guy's like, oh yeah, I got this. And he's like sliding left and right, but he must actually be a pretty decent driver or very lucky because they don't all die. When I said pretty serious mountain, I'm going to give myself a little credit there. I think I got a good prediction accuracy there. I said they flew somewhere to go skiing and that was wrong because they didn't fly. They drove and they didn't go out west. They went to Vermont. Hold up. The serious mountain you said was what they were looking at from the cabin. No, 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 no. Yes. Is that what I said? Yes. But what I actually meant <laughs> okay. was the serious mountain they were driving down. I also predicted that somebody will die of hypothermia by a male murderer. This is really interesting because this is an interesting book in that we don't actually know what the murder weapon was. So I'm going to say I'm right. Murder weapon was hypothermia. I predicted it all along. Good on me. How smart that I could figure that out. I also predicted that someone might get stabbed by a ski pole, and I was totally wrong. There is no skiing in this ski weekend. They, they do go to a ski lodge. I suppose they might go skiing. No part of this book is about the actual skiing of it. So we don't know about that. There's no stabbing by a ski pole. But I did say no one's going to die from getting stabbed by a ski pole, and I was right about that. And I said Lisa and Corey are in the book, and I could not have been more wrong. This book is the most standalone of any of the books in the entire series. The only reference you get is that one of the characters lives on Fear Street and they're all from Shadyside and that's all you get. The only thing I got right is that it's a serious mountain and that someone will die of hypothermia by a male murderer. So my prediction was basically Shadyside high school kids were gonna go on a ski weekend and yeah that happened. I said that yeah it was gonna be a perfect setting for murder and there was murder. I said the murderer would be a male and I said the weapon was a knife. And just like you're giving yourself credit for hypothermia, I'm going to give myself credit for knife because it could have been a knife. You don't know. You're right. And as 100% correct, it was a knife. I had a fun prediction that was like, I really hope someone would get killed by a ski pole, but no one did. Why would you write a book about a ski weekend and not kill someone with a ski pole? Except, fun fact, somebody did get killed by a ski pole. Who got 
got killed by a ski pole? The guy that got killed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? All my predictions were right. Every single one of them. That was weird, right? Ski pole? You know what? I got ski another- Ski pole right to the knee, and it somehow killed him. Ski binding right to the face. <laughs> Dead. Hot air balloon right to the chest. <laughs> death <laughs> wow i mean like honestly that rabid jaguar came out of nowhere right can jaguars get rabies i need a fact check rl stein there and then the bird that like launched out of nowhere with the talons yeah right on his face it was weird this giant earthworm literally strangled him to death the weirdest thing ever in the middle of winter you'd never see it coming it was like that movie tremors <laughs> Anyways, the plot synopsis. Yeah. What happens in this book? First thing we have to mention here is the chapter titles are gone. It was an experimental thing. R.L. Stein tried it out once and he decided, you know what? I'm not going to do chapter titles. We're just going to go back to numbers. The major plot point here is three kids, friends from high school and a stranger are on their way home in a broken ass car in the middle of a snowstorm. Snowstorm is the key plot element here. They get snowed in. On their way back from the ski lodge, they're giving somebody a ride home. This is somebody that's become friends with them over the last couple of days. But the thing is, it's a complete whiteout. And he suggests that they go take a country road because this doesn't make any sense to me. But apparently the country roads are plowed better than the state roads. So I have to say, I drive from one end of our state to the other end frequently. And I've done it during two massive snowstorms in the past few months. And let me tell you, that is an untrue fact. You better stay on that goddamn highway and go to the rest areas if you need to take a break because that's where the plows are going to be. Yeah, that was total BS. That's kind of, that's your second hint. Going on, they end up at this house. Basically, the car breaks down. They just can't keep going anymore. And lo and behold, there's a house in the woods. The car doesn't break down. It actually stalls and overheats. Right, but it does that. But he manages to start it again. What they do is they decide that after that, like, you know what, let's not drive this possibly crappy car any further. There's a house right there. Wouldn't it be safer to stay in that house than be on the road in this car that might break down? It's not broken down per se when they leave it. So they leave it by the side of the highway and they go inside the house and they're welcomed in. They're not by the side of the highway, they're by the side of the country road. By the side of the country highway. They uh, go inside the house and they're welcomed in by Lou, this friendly giant, and that's it. I mean, they basically have to weather out the storm. But Lou is not as friendly as he first seems to be. Things are getting kind of weird. They find a dead body. It's messed up. But let's get into characters first. Yeah, so first of all, let's talk about Ariel. Ariel is the main character and everything in this book is from her point of view. There is nothing from anybody else's point of view. It is very, very first person. She's got a scientific thought process. It actually mentions a couple times she wants to be a doctor. She happens to know a couple things about medicine and how the human body works. And that actually plays a part in the plot. She actually came to the ski weekend with her boyfriend, Randy. I don't quite understand this part, but... He decides that he wants to get back to Shadyside by Sunday so he can be in his basketball game. But why would you go to the ski weekend and not decide this beforehand? They get in a massive fight and he decides to leave early back to Shadyside. I think maybe he's even more of a jerk than you think he is and he actually just wants to go watch a basketball game. They get in a yelling match in the restaurant. The other two people they're with sort of peace out from this argument because it's really awkward to watch couples fight they get in this massive yelling match and he just basically screams well i'm leaving and storms out of the restaurant and gets on the next bus to shady side and he just leaves a note saying i'm just gonna be watching my basketball game and that's that what a boyfriend yeah they're basically breaking up after this she's also really close friends with doug who's the other guy in the trip He's like a brother to her. They've grown up together. They went to, I think they went to elementary school together. I think they were friends since third grade. She knows him really well. They have this ongoing inside joke. Yeah, so the inside joke is about her name. Apparently, she's named after the character from the Shakespeare's The Tempest, Ariel. This is really interesting. This is, I, I want to get into this later on where we talk about, this is an ongoing conversation about R.L. Stein and foreshadowing. We want to talk about the Tempest a little bit. She's the character that lives on Fear Street. Yes, she is the one single... Link? ...tie-in to the whole thing. Well, let's talk about her friend Doug. When you think 
too much testosterone, you would think of someone like Doug. I agree. He's a show off. He's macho, you know, he's a hunter, maybe a gatherer, I don't know. <laughs> he, he's Paleo, he's very paleo, right? He would be a guy eating the paleo diet. He's on the wrestling team. He's like a man's man with very little brain. I don't know. He didn't come off as the wisest person. He is he's very hot tempered, very argumentative. The book starts off with him nearly getting them killed. Well, he's, yeah, he's trying to show off that he can drive. So during this horrible storm they have to drive through, he's driving with one hand, he's driving with no hands, he's swerving. It's kind of awful. I would not want to be in that car. And actually, none of the other characters want to be in that car either. Nope. They really don't want to be in that car. He's driving down this very serious mountain, and this is no car to be doing that in. This is no Subaru, that's for sure. This is a broken down Plymouth. Ariel thinks that he's just sort of putting up a front, and he's not as macho as he's trying to come off to be, but I don't know, I never got that. But she does know him better than we do. That's true. He's actually dating a girl named Shannon who came on this trip. We don't know much about her. We know she's Doug's girlfriend, and we know that the parents disapprove of the relationship, and she's mostly concerned with getting home on time, because she's convinced she will be grounded for the rest of her life if she doesn't make it back on time, and her parents find out she went on a ski weekend with Doug. Because when she went on the ski weekend, when she gave the list of people who were going, Doug was not on that list. Nope. I can relate to that. I do yeah, that. she just gave Ariel, oh yeah, me and my girlfriend Ariel, yep, we're going up there. That's it, just the two of us is probably what happened. Well, when we were talking about Halloween party and you just could not get over the fact that parents didn't react to all these people going, it's like you would just list the people the parents would know and approve of and that's the end of that in the interim anna has convinced me that i was wrong about that rant i went on i fully admit that when i was in high school i would just list the names of people on the approved list and i yep. would not list the names of the people on the no-go list the other person in their car because i think we're done with shannon right we're totally done with shannon this is what we were talking about earlier when this is not really a character driven plot here so after her fight with her boyfriend randy some guy named red shows up at the table to try to like talk to her and play nice with her and they end up befriending this guy his name is red he totally gloms onto the group after randy leaves don't be that trusting folks they're just teenagers and this guy is a little bit older and i think he's a little bit of a pickup artist well, it's kind of gross because he kisses Ariel. Yeah. That's not okay. Basically, he knows how to take advantage of people. He's kind of a con artist. And we're saying this now, having read the book, but you kind of get a hint of it. If you're an adult reading this book and you read the situation where she had this public fight in front of the entire restaurant and her boyfriend storms off and this guy just shows up out of nowhere and acts all nice. In our adult minds, we're going, this guy's taking advantage of of a high school girl. Is it because we're cynical, you think? No, it's because we're 30 and we know how the world works, okay? <laughs> Come on. Literally. Now, I'm not sure what this would have read like if I was a teenager reading this book or a preteen or whatever. I don't know what this is aimed at. To me, reading it now, it's like, oh my God, this is obvious. What are you guys doing? But he seems like a nice guy at first. There is a point in the book, I would say a third of the way through, where you know for sure. And you're just like, okay, I know what's happening here. They end up going to a house on a hill. They bring all their crap up and they meet Lou and Eva. So Lou, you described him as a giant of a man. He's uh, very boisterous. And drunk. He has a drinking problem. He just keeps drinking beer nonstop. He's very gregarious. He does nothing but tell stories about how people he knows have died. And he laughs about their deaths. And he beats his wife. He's not too smart. He's also really abusive. Yeah. He's a violent man. He's throwing things. He's ripping things. Yeah. So he beats his wife, Eva. She gets like a black eye, I think. Yeah. To the point where her eye doesn't even fully open. And he also sprains Doug's knee. Doug basically beats him in a wrestling match. He's not a good loser. So when Doug's like, okay, well, I want good wrestling and gets up to leave, Lou grabs his leg and like wrenches it back and it basically almost tears his leg off. And then Eva is Lou's wife. She's just constantly sad. She's just one of those people that I guess has just been down on her luck her whole life. 
Her brother was an asshole. Her other brother's an asshole. Her husband's an asshole. She's just not having the best life right now. Well, we're going to go into spoilers now because she really comes through in the end. That's true. This would not have ended well for the innocent little high school kids. If she hadn't called the police. That's right. Yeah, so Red is actually Eva's brother. And Lou's brother-in-law. Basically, they hatched this whole plot because what happened was their other brother... Jake. ...was screwing them out of the inheritance, I guess. And so they murdered him while they were visiting him. They're just over for a nice ski weekend of their own and they just straight up, I guess, ended up killing him. And now they need to cover up the crime and get the inheritance money. And so they're like, oh, you know what? We'll just frame these kids. That's the plot. But what was their plan? Did they know that Red would, like, what if he didn't find anyone to pick up? What if no one fell for his little... Uh, this guy's a pro. How did he know that he wouldn't be taken for another group's special run? Of some sort. I mean, like, I suspected him, but I knew for sure when they went to look at the car and the car was in the ravine. That's when you know for sure. Because you know already the night before he went out and he was outside. What was he doing? He was pushing the car into the ravine. Duh. I think I was onto him when he told them to get off the highway. Because he said, oh, I grew up here. I know better. And it's like, you're obviously lying. And he's like, oh, there's a house on the hill. Yeah, I just happened to see it. And it's like, okay. Nobody else saw it. Everyone was really surprised that he could have seen it from yeah. the road. So basically, a couple pages in, it's like, oh, okay. You're clearly in on whatever is going to happen. Yeah. Because I knew it was not going to be one of the three other kids in from the car. True. All those things were definitely factors in me being suspicious of him, but it's incontrovertible after the whole car in the ditch thing. Did you think he was in on something with Lou and Eva? Or did you think that he was going to do something on his own? I thought he was on his own. I thought that Lou and Eva were just a couple rando dumbasses. There's this one scene where Lou has to go out and he has to put on a coat. But the coat is too small for him. It has all these like ski tags on it. And he comes back in and he talks about how like he hasn't skied in forever. You know, Ariel's thinking... Well, why does the, his coat have so many ski tags on it if he hasn't gone skiing in a while? They're talking about how they found these framed photos shoved in drawers, but it was obviously from the mantle and they could tell it was from there because of like how the dust was. And it's like, I had already suspected red, so I basically put it together pretty quickly. I had my suspicions about Lou. I was sort of vacillating back and forth between maybe it's a home invasion and he just happens to be crashing here at this. Basically, this could have been somebody's summer cabin, right? And he's just crashing here. So I thought maybe that's what it was. Or I thought there might be some other reason. Obviously, that wasn't his jacket. We understand that. But I didn't sense any murderous intent in this guy. I just thought he was just some stupid guy that was did you think his over-the-top violence was like a red herring yeah obviously he's a violent man and he's not a good guy but i don't think it's sort of like the whole thing with jesse in the stepsister where he kept having this circumstantial evidence where it was like oh it must be jesse doing all these evil things and in this book lou is so angry and violent did it come off like Oh, it's one of those other things that R.O. Stein is trying to set up where he's making this character really seem so bad. And in the end, you're going to get the rug pulled out from under you. It's true. And it was that. And it was also the fact that he just seemed so impulsive in his violence that you didn't think he had any kind of in-depth plot, any scheme to him. Do you think Red thought up the entire thing? Definitely. It was all red all the way, and he gets his comeuppance at the end, doesn't but, he? But the thing is, doesn't Red blame Lou for thinking up the plan? Because he's like, I knew this wouldn't work. We should have just buried his body. And Lou goes, you're just like your dumb sister, because what happens when the snow melts? So it seems like Lou's the one that thought it all up. But Lou has written way, way too dumb to be able to do that or think of this i don't think it was lou i think it was red and even if lou comes off as thinking that it was his plan it's probably only because red made him think that so it was his plan what was the plan let's uh, go through what they did to poor jake oh, he's not that poor because he got all the inheritance apparently but so apparently it's a story of jake ava and red jake gets all the inheritance from their rich parents and ava and red get screwed over i guess 
Ava then goes on to Mary Lou, who's just a violent and drunk man. And all of them are visiting Jake at the ski lodge for the weekend. This is their private ski lodge house because Jake is loaded. And somehow Jake is killed with a ski pole knife hypothermia scenario. Now they need to cover up the crime because if they just leave... It turns out there's people in town that already know they're visiting Jake. So there's witnesses saying like, oh, they should know what happened. So they can't just leave. They need to figure out some way. And so they come up with this convoluted plan. They're going to frame the kids for it. This whole thing is set up. They have a whole bunch of loaded guns in the house. Or so they're told. Red feeds them this whole scenario of how Luke and Ava are planning to rob them in the middle of the night. And they have to escape. And he secretly fixed the jeep so they can leave. They just need to sneak out. But you got to grab the gun before you leave. Just in case. You know, what if anything happens? And they get into the barn, which serves as the garage where the car is. And there's Jake just leaning up against the post. Holding out a gun. Oh my god, he's got a gun. And it literally all falls into place. It's miraculous how their cockamamie scheme almost works. And it would have worked too if it wasn't for... Aerial science smarts. Luke comes out and he goes, Oh my god, you shot Jake. He's Eva's brother. You guys are murderers. You're coming back in the house. We're gonna get the police to talk to you. Phone lines aren't working, so you murderers need to go inside. And the entire time, Ariel's like, I need to see the body again. I really need to see what happened. So in the middle of the night, she creeps down to the cellar and she finds the Jake body. And then she's looking at it. First of all, he's very cold. He's very rigid. And she looks at the bullet wound and there's no blood. It's just a very little smidge of blood, which is not normal because from where the bullet was, there should be like gushes. Yeah, it's a big old chest wound. Would have hit some really serious blood vessels i mean all the blood vessels end up going to the chest well it depends on where in the chest right yeah but somewhere in the chest they all join up don't they it doesn't necessarily have to go there this guy got shot right in the heart i mean like did he get shot in the heart dog is a crack shot got him right in the heart yeah i don't think he was shot right in the heart but regardless there should be more blood than there was so she's just thinking like you know what there's no way that this guy was alive when he was shot so we're being framed for something Unfortunately for her, Red is the one who comes into the cellar to see what's going on. So she explains to Red everything and he just goes, I wish you were dumber. Because the kids like try to escape again and he has a pistol and they're like, what the hell are you doing? You don't need a gun. He goes, yeah, I need a gun. You guys aren't supposed to leave. You weren't supposed to figure this out. And they're like, shit. And they find out that Red is actually in on it. And they were duped. And then Luke comes out. There's this great scene where... Ariel figures like, we need to get out of here. There's a snowmobile here. If I get on the snowmobile and distract the two of them, then maybe Doug and Shannon will be able to go to the road and get help. Before she figures that out, she actually manages to grab a couple of icy snowballs, knocks out Lou. He drops his gun long enough to cause a distraction so they can actually run to the barn and get the snowmobile. I mean, doesn't this fall along with R.L. Stein's long line of kick-ass female protagonists? Absolutely. Yeah, Ariel is really cool. And that was the long as we're in an in-depth plot. I want to talk about foreshadowing in this book. So, The Tempest. Shakespeare's The Tempest is referenced in this book. Great going in, you know, long tradition of referencing earlier literary works in your own book. Very nice. Obviously, the Ariel character in The Tempest is important. Disclaimer, I have not read The Tempest. Oh my god. And therefore, I know nothing about it. But I know that Ariel is supposed to be a magical being that actually ends up calling the Tempest and causing it. That's cool. Tempest is like a storm and this thing is about a storm. So that's nice. That's relevant to the book. And that's nice. I think he goes a little bit too far with the whole mousetrap thing. So the mousetraps don't have anything to do with the Tempest. I think the Tempest is a good reference and it's a good use of his writing and such. And it's good use of literary foreshadowing but i think the mouse traps are a little bit too much so there's a couple of instances where you see mice getting caught in mouse traps and dying horribly ariel's reaction to it every time is oh they're trapped and she's got this weird sense of foreboding like 
maybe were trapped also and yes they are trapped in a plot a scheme to entrap them in murder that they did not commit i think that the mousetrap thing is a little bit over the top as far as foreshadowing goes still not joe hill level foreshadow over the head nest but starting to cross over into that territory i definitely gave arl stein a lot of credit over the last couple of books for that i want to roll that back a little bit and say he's doing it a bit much now but I did enjoy the Tempest reference and now I think I will actually go on to read the Tempest because of this book so I'll let you guys know how that goes I'll let you guys know what I think of the Tempest definitely in an upcoming uh read podcast or maybe a rando cast for sure at the end of the book the police come so Ariel does something really cool where she gets on the snowmobile in an attempt to distract Lou and Red and she actually drives the snowmobile right into them and the last minute they like dive out of the way because otherwise they'd be run over giving Doug and Shannon the chance to run away. And you know what? Ariel is really smart because she's already onto them and they've been seeing the whole time oh yeah you know the snowmobile is broken oh yeah that thing doesn't run. She's like they've been lying about everything else this week and I bet this thing does run. She crashes it. Apparently, yeah, well, she's never driven a snowmobile before, I don't think. And she's going too fast. She tries to make a turn. It flips over. And she starts running towards the lake. The snowmobile's wrecked now. So she's running. They're running after her. They catch up and they grab her. And after they grab her, they don't know what to do. And that's where they start arguing about how their plan didn't work. And how they should have thought of a better plan. Which... Yes. Why would they think that plan? I'm sorry, like, no matter how smooth the talker Red is, how did he know he was going to find three teenagers that would be perfect for their plan? Because they had four people initially, and if Randy were still there, he would not be in that car. And what are the chances, like, another group of teens would be so dumb to let someone in? Or even adults? Or bad drivers? Like, what if they were perfectly fine drivers who could get to Cortland where he needed to go? You know what I mean? Like, there's so many factors and variables that had to go perfectly for their plan to work. Yeah, they should have thought of a better plan. Like, the Fargo thing of just letting his body freeze. They would have the money at that point, and then they could do whatever they had to do to get new lives. It was an ill-conceived plan, for sure. But this is no time to argue about it, because the police are showing up. You can hear the sirens going down the road, and they're on the lake. Eva basically said, I caught the police. We can't go through with this, because they want to kill these teenagers now. And they're like psh there is no way that eva timid little useless woman would have called the police on us and she did and they realize it now they're standing there on the lake and red goes i'm not going down i'm gonna take ariel hostage this is where the plan really goes off the rails yeah, so she's more on the lake he's chasing after her and it's thawing slightly the ice breaks away and red falls through he tries to come out and like every time he tries to get onto the ice it just keeps breaking and finally ariel says that and then he went down and never came up she actually tries to help him out which is admirable it doesn't work out and he he drowns and that's that Two brothers dead because of their parents' inheritance. It's actually, it's Shakespearean, isn't it? The tragedy. Lou and Eva are basically hovering over the the hole that Red fell in. And Eva's crying. And Lou's trying to comfort his wife, which... They're going to jail. I guess it depends on how much of a role she played into it, right? Theoretically, they could just blame everything on Red. And say it was all him and... Well, no, because all three kids were taken to the police... And they gave statements. So obviously Lou's in trouble. But I don't know how much Eva is going to get into. I mean, honestly, the kids don't know who killed Jake. They, they have no idea. One thing that the adults in the situation did a good job of is not revealing the entire plan. And I don't think they ever told him exactly who killed who and what happened. Yeah, but Lou was going to kill them. So that's <laughs> intent to murder right there. That's true, yeah. But Eva didn't intend to do anything. And plus, they could say, like, well, she was being beaten by Lou. So at no point, I, I'm assuming that she's going to get in trouble for being complicit. It's hard to say what would happen. If Lou has a good lawyer, he could probably weasel out of it. I don't think they're in a position to get good lawyers. What, with all the parents' money? They're not going to get the money. Why not? Who's going to get the money? That's money that's going to go into someone else's coffers because that money doesn't go to them if they murder someone for the money. You don't get the inheritance if you murder the person to get it. That's not how that works. 
For a lot of the action, Ariel is just going through it thinking, well, I hope Randy gets really upset when he finds out I died and he blames himself. <laughs> she's going to break up with him, obviously. I mean, she's too cool for him. Yeah, now. like obviously. On. Yeah, he seems like a total dumbass. Nitpicks? It's not a nitpick, but it's more of a say goodbye to your Ohio theory. Oh, yeah. So they're six hours away from Vermont. So now we're starting to look at... Mm. New England? Yeah. Maybe, or Mid-Atlantic, I guess. Yeah, so we're looking more like Massachusetts, I guess. Didn't you explicitly say, there is no way it could be New England during your whole Ohio? I did. The whole ski weekend thing was really going to work out because there's a lot of ski resorts in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and New York that are within a six-hour driving distance of Ohio, and it would have worked out totally great up until they name drop Vermont, and then it's like, oh. Ooh, damn. That kind of blows it open, doesn't it? Maybe they're still in Ohio. Ohio is the closest of the Midwest states to Vermont. And if they drive very, very quickly and way above the speed limit, then perhaps they could get to Vermont. Yeah, so I think I think it's still Ohio. I think they just... Let, let's look at it this way. Vermont... Is a state. That is probably, at the very least, about a 10-hour drive from Ohio. Yeah, about 8 to 10 hours, depending on how you drive. If you speed, you could probably do it in 8 hours from, like, the borderline. I don't think a kid like Randy is going to be taking a bus back to Ohio from Vermont. Yeah, that's that's also true. Yeah, the the bus theory. I I don't know what to say. This is um this is one of those things. It's definitely Ohio. We weren't on Fear Street, so I don't really think there's much to add to the mythos here. There's nothing to add to the mythos aside from the fact that it's definitely Ohio. Nineties things. Yeah, so not really a 90s thing, but when they first get to the house, they all try calling home, and even though the line is really staticky, they do manage to get their calls through. Everyone gets to talk to their parents and say they're stuck and they're snowed in at some random house, but Ariel can't get through to her parents, and so she has to leave a voicemail, and what she says is that, I called home, but all I got was the tape, rather than the answering machine, which is what we normally say, and I thought that was kind of weird. Not sure it's a 90s thing. I've never heard anybody refer to it as the tape. If anybody out there knows of it being called the tape, in your place where you live, did people call it the tape? Also, okay, if this was right now, they'd have GPS on their smartphone and Google would be like, oh, traffic is clear here, go here. And they'd say like, don't go down this weird country road. They still made that unilateral decision to just get off the highway. So once you get off, they would still be stuck on that road. The voice of Google is hard to argue against. And I feel like that would have been a scene in the book where Google is saying, keep straight at the fork. And Red would be going like, no guys, trust me, I, uh, I'm i from around here. You gotta go left. Like that would have been a, a thing. One thing about the cover that really bothers me now that I've read the book is that on the cover, first of all, they have their skis and ski boots, which no, they didn't. But all four teenagers are in the cabin looking at the guy in the mask, like the ski mask. But in the scene, it's actually Red who was wearing the ski mask. And it was only Doug, Shannon, and Ariel who saw the ski mask guy. So this cover is actually not an actual scene in the book. Um, one interesting thing about this book is the architectural layout of the house was very similar to a ski cabin that I recently stayed at. And so it was very easy for me to imagine everything going on in the book because I was like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I know exactly what this house looks like. So that was kind of cool. What'd you think of the book? That was okay. It was not the worst book I've read from Fear Street. So it's not bad like Sleepwalker was. I liked how the girl was into science. This book had a lot of potential. I like the really easy gimme Tempest shout out that even somebody that hasn't read The Tempest still got. That was cool. The one thing, it just went a little too far with the whole mousetrap stuff. It was a little bit too Joe Hill for me. That's what kept it from getting the full 2.0 stars. I'll give it a 1.5 that rounds up to 2 on the, you know, the Goodreads scale, but it's not the full-hearted full-throated two stars that it could have been. Are we just giving it stars? 
You're not giving it two snowmobiles out of five? Two icy snowballs? Yeah, I think I would give it two icy snowballs out of five on the Fear Street scale. I mean, the mousetrap thing didn't bother me as much as it bothered you, apparently. I had fun with it. I don't know. It wasn't, like I said, awful, but it did have a lot of potential that it didn't live up to. And I think the problem with that was that large passages of the book were really building up that potential. Yeah, the climax was very anticlimactic. It fizzled out, didn't it? It did a little bit. The red death scene was pretty cool, but I feel like it needed something more to it. The basic things were starting to detract from it, where one of the major plot points at the giant climax scene at the end, where she throws snowballs at Lou, those snowballs were actually made the previous day in an interim between two snowstorms. So actually, they should have been covered up by another layer of snow and been inaccessible at that point. And that stuck out at me, like a glaring error in the text and really took me out of the story. And that's just one example of how it kind of loses the plot at the end. It kind of unravels and doesn't live up to all its potential. It was a nitpick. I should have put that in a nitpicks instead of afterthoughts and ratings. It just occurred to me now. Also, in the scene where they're trying to escape the second time after Red has revealed like that he is part of the plan and they run to the barn and then they go, shit, we don't have the Jeep car keys. Red has them. What would Red and Lou have done if they did get the car keys from Red and just drove away? They would have gotten run over. Yeah. <laughs> Lou and Red did not come up with a good plan. Like, the more you think about it, the more you just go, they got really lucky and then really unlucky. It was almost about to work, and then it didn't. And the question is, how far would Eva have gone had they not found out that Red was in on it? Would she have let them call the police and get these kids locked up? Or would she have crumbled? Because you never really get much of her psyche. But she does tell them at one point, she tells Ariel, like, you need to leave, you shouldn't be here. Yeah, you don't get much of her character. We don't really know for sure if she's good, she's bad, what her marriage is like. So when Red was telling them that he heard Lou and Eva arguing about, he told them that they were planning on robbing the kids and that's why they should leave. And he's like, and then I heard him hit her. But if he was in on it, then did that argument not happen? But clearly Lou actually did hit Eva because she had like a horrible bruise and couldn't open her eye. Or she was just play acting. But she had a bruise. Oh, you mean she had some dark makeup that looked like a bruise and she was holding one eye and squinting it? Do you think she was not actually bruised then? We don't know. That's the thing. We don't know very much about her character whatsoever. Well, I mean, it's conceivable that he is an abusive asshole. Absolutely. Given how much he was drinking, he could have been. Or so, maybe it was all an act. We don't really know. Yeah, it's hard to say if yeah. you think about it. Like, she could have it could, She could have been very scheming and conniving and like totally in on it and only bailed to save herself at the end. Yeah, because the kids don't know. Yeah, we we really don't know. Maybe she's the mastermind behind the whole thing. And she murdered Jake. We have no idea. Maybe she's the puppet master pulling the strings. And maybe she's going to reappear in another Fear Street book. I know that there's other Ski Weekend books. I think Ski Weekend 2 is in like a couple books. Oh my god, maybe she's going to infiltrate the high school and pretend to be one of the students. Gonna have a party? A Christmas party. That's right. I mean, this has happened before. There is precedent here. We could easily see her fool uh, a whole group of high school kids. They didn't mention she looked a lot younger. What I think is funny is... She looks about 25, but they make it seem like she's ancient. She looks young for her age, and it's like, Jesus Christ, (laughs) how old am I? Uh, yeah, this book, if you're reading this as an adult, it really makes you feel your age. The next book is The Fire Game. When you're playing with fire, someone is bound to get burned. Predictions based on the cover. Well, okay, looking at the cover, I see uh, a girl from the 70s being led by the hand by a boy from the 90s. They're running away from a house that's on fire. It's literally engulfed in a giant fireball. So I'm thinking there's an arsonist. The murder weapon will be fire. Somebody's going to die from a fire, smoke inhalation, or get burned to death. Hopefully burned to death. That would be pretty crazy. Just like, you know, like we're talking about like some Denethor in Return of the King, <laughs> you know, running on fire, you know, jumping off. Or actually, just the other night we saw Hacksaw Ridge, lots of people burning alive there. Screw it. There might even be a flamethrower situation going on here, right? I mean, look at the fear in the girl's eyes. She's looking like she's really running from something. I mean, they're already a good distance from the house, but she sees a real danger. Actually, she's looking at the boy 
And she's scared of him. Maybe he's the arsonist. And she knew all along. You know, we got this long line of badass female protagonists. So I'm going to guess male arsonist and the girl is on to him. All right, what do you think, Anna? When you said, I see fire, I could only think of the Ed Sheeran song from right. the Hobbit movie. There's two people running away from a house that's on fire. But this is called the fire game. I think it's a bunch of pyromaniac teenagers. They're trying to one-up each other, right? Mm -hmm. So you start small and then you end up burning down a fucking house. And the game got out of hand. I think the issue is arson. I guess they can't die from smoke or fire because you already did that. So I guess I have to say someone got stabbed. There's a stabbing. I don't know with what. I'm not going to say with a knife. Mm. I'll just leave that part blank. Stabbed with fire and smoke. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right Stab in the lungs. <laughs> Stabbed by some ashes. You know. She does look very spooked on the cover. I don't. I think they're both dressed from the same time period. What kind, what teenagers wear this though? Yeah, I don't know. This is what the high school librarian and the new young teacher wear, <laughs> not high schoolers. That's true. I mean, I've seen I've seen high schoolers wear what the boys wearing, but that girl, that is some dated fashion. They're both pretty dated, I have to say. I mean, I guess when I was growing up in Utah, maybe some girls wore what she's wearing. It's it's a very conservative. Uh, it's very prim and proper. Yeah, I mean, like that skirt goes below the knees. If you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so the house is engulfed in flames and he's leading her away from it. I would say male arsonist, but someone has to get stabbed because you already took the death by fire and everything associated with fire. You know, with your luck, watch you get everything right. And it's like... You didn't say that it'd be a game. I'm taking the game. Yeah, no, that was a smart move because it actually literally says fire game on the title. It literally says when you're playing with fire, someone is bound to get burned. Well, you know what? Isn't a flamethrower? Thrower, kind of like playing with fire, throwing fire around. They're not Mario. They're not okay. shooting fireballs. So that's your prediction that it's not Mario? Yes, that is my prediction. It's not Mario. Okay, well, when it turns out. Bowser is like at the end of the book and you have to save a princess, I'll be very sad. Okay, I'm gonna call you out on this when it turns out that you were wrong about this particular instance. Okay. Okay. Predictions locked and loaded and all that good stuff. All right, guys. It was really nice getting back into this podcast again after such a long break. Thanks for listening. We really appreciate you guys sticking with us. It's going to be a long journey ahead. Many, many books left to go in the Fear Street series. And we're going to try to make it through together. Thanks for listening to another thrilling episode of Rhett Read Podcast. If you like what you hear give us a shout out if not let us know why in the comments don't forget to rate review comment share like and subscribe you can follow us at red read podcast on twitter and facebook or send suggestions or fan mail to red.read.podcast at gmail.com until next time peace